Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Mike Schaefer. I'm a postdoc in Kelly Wrighton's lab at CSU. And Kayla, do you want to introduce yourself quickly? Uh, yeah, so I'm Michaela Borton. Um, I'm a postdoc at PNNL, um, but I was a previous member of the Wrighton lab um, at CSU uh, where we developed DRAM. And so I'm excited to tell you about it today. Yeah, so I was the primary developer of the programming computational side of DRAM and Kayla was the real driver in the building the metabolism knowledge base that we needed to be able to build out what DRAM does. So we're really excited to talk, talk to you about it today. And so as you all know, this talk is a part of the microbiome informatics webinar series. Um, so it looks like everyone who's come to all of them, you're around halfway through. So hope you learned a lot and hope it's gonna help you applying it to your own research. Uh, last week, uh, Dylan Cronin uh, gave a talk on how you can go from raw reads that you get from untargeted metagenomic sequencing uh, and build that up through various processing steps to get to a set of bins. Um, so then what we're gonna talk to you today is how you can go from that set of bins and try to start asking questions about what they do. So what fun potential functions do these bins encode and how can that be related to ecosystem functions, whether you're studying in the human gut or in permafrost soils. And so we care about digging into these microbial functions because these are really what mediate the health and environmental, a lot of the health and environmental impacts that bacteria can have. For example, if you take the human gut, uh, it's known that there's various bacteria that exist within the human gut that can actually metabolize drugs that humans take. So for example, some drugs are actually in the pro-drug form, so an inactive form, go into the gut microbiome and then or go into the gut where microbes present there can activate that drug and be active for them. And that's what your body actually needs to have the intended effect. Um, we can also have scenarios where there's certain drugs where the person takes them, uh, it's metabolized, then that uh, metabolite, that downstream inactivated version of the drug um, makes it into the gut microbiome then the gut microbes can actually reactivate that and then cause negative side effects um, that are dependent on certain bacteria being present in the human gut. So it's only by looking at the functions that these bacteria have that we can understand the impacts on metabolism and these environmental functions. And similarly, similarly uh, we can look at environmental samples. Um, if we trying to understand contributions to greenhouse gases, Microbes can be involved in a wide variety of these processes, ranging from the bacteria that uh, undergo photosynthesis and can then uh, turn carb take carbon out of the atmosphere and turn it into biomass, uh, or microbes which can contribute to greenhouse, mass uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, either by generating CO2 through respiration or generating uh, methane through methanogenesis or various other uh, processes uh, that involve ecosystem level functions. And by understanding the bacteria that are there and the potential functions uh, that they can do, uh, we can really start to build that understanding and scale from a sequence of a genome bin to impacts that micro microbes can have at the ecosystem scale. And so this is a review of what Dylan talked about last week for anyone who uh, a little bit or is new to this stuff or wasn't able to attend last week's talk. Um, so we're going to start out with our mixed environmental genomic DNA. So this is going to, we're going to extract DNA from our sample, whether it's uh, human feces or soil. Um, we're going to extract all that DNA out. Um, and that's just going to be mixed of all the DNA from all the bacteria that were there. Uh, then we're going to randomly fragment that uh, into these short sequences because uh, we're going to be doing some short read sequencing uh, in this case, so doing some Illumina sequencing. Uh, we're going to do that and we're going to get out all these short reads. Uh, we're going to take all these short reads and kind of try to mash them together so we can find some longer sequences. Um, so this, can, this gives us assembled contigs or scaffolds. Uh, so these are longer pieces of DNA. Um, that are just kind of a collection of a subset of what was in that original mixed environmental gDNA sample. Um, but what we can do after that is apply binning techniques. 
So with these binning techniques, we're going to take those uh, scaffolds, we're going to sort them based on uh, things like the nucleotide content of that scaffold, as well as the abundance profile. So are two scaffolds correlated uh, with each other in abundance across samples? Uh, and we're going to use that to build these bins. Uh, and these bins are approximate representations of uh, a genome that was present in the original sample. So we can get information not only about was this gene present in this sample, but uh, which genome did this come from and what other genes are uh, encoded by that same genome. But then we want to expand on that. We want to go beyond just what bins are there. Uh, we want to functionally annotate them so we know what their genomic potential is. And so to do that, first, we're going to predict coding sequences. Uh, so we're going to look for where the protein coding genes are. Um, you can also look for uh, non-coding rRNA sequences, but we're really going to focus on the protein coding sequences today. Uh, so we're going to find all of those um, represented by the arrows that I've now added to those little scaffolds. Um, then we're going to extract out those predictive amino acid sequences for each of the proteins. And we're going to compare them to databases with genes of known function. Because if we're able to take that sequence and find another sequence in the database that's very similar, um, so either by uh, sequence alignment or hidden Markov model-based techniques, uh, we can say these two genes are really similar to each other and we know what this one in the database does, so we're going to assign this as the potential function of that gene. Uh, and so therefore we can say that maybe this gene has this function within this genome. And then we can bring that all together. So we can take all the annotations from all the significant hits that we get from all of our genes and start to build out a picture of what that genome is potentially capable of doing in, in, in that original environment. So for example, here we have glycolysis in the TCA cycle. So maybe we see that we have all the genes for glycolysis in the genes for the first half of the TCA cycle. So we can start to hypothesize uh, that this genome or this organism with this genome is potentially capable of uh, generating acetyl-CoA via from simple sugars via these pathways. And so then, because this is metagenomics, um, we're looking at a whole community of microbes. Uh, we want to understand functional potential from as many genomes as we can that exist within this community. So this is a figure that includes seven different genome, what we call genome cartoons. Uh, so these are little representations kind of giving you a mental model of what each microbe is capable of. Uh, so for example, if we look at that top left uh, little microbe there, that's, gonna, that's our rhodobacter. Um, so we can see the potential functions that it does. We can see that it has a flagella. We can see that it's able to import uh, various sulfur compounds um, and then output sulfate compounds. Uh, we can see that it has a proton pump, so it looks like potentially it could be generating ATP by oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and so that gives us an idea of what the functions within that individual microbe are. Um, and then together we can say, okay, it looks like this microbe is a sulfur oxidizer. And then we can, can integrate that uh, with our understanding the environment in which it exists in. So maybe we can say, therefore, that this micro, this specific microbe is potentially having an impact on the sulfur cycling that's going on uh, within this specific environment. And you can do that across all of your genomes and get an idea of the individual impacts that each could be having and connect it to those larger processes. But understanding functional potential from genomes is a huge pain uh, with traditional techniques. So the most common annotation techniques, things you might have heard of before, like PROCA, RAS, or a variety of other tools, are usually going to give you output in the form of either a GenBank file or a big tab delimited file with each gene and all the potential functions that that gene could have. Um, and if you want to build genome cartoons, if you want to build these mental models of what each genome is capable of, that's a giant pain. Um, it takes people who are experts in metabolism in our lab up to a week or maybe sometimes even more to bring together all those genes, all the annotations of all those genes and kind of connect them together into, path into pathways and figure out what each genome could do. And so that's fine when, like in the previous figure, you only have seven different genomes. But if you want to look at hundreds or tens or, or tens or hundreds or thousands of genomes, 
uh, that's not going to be sustainable. And our genome catalog continues to grow. Um, these big uh, papers keep coming out every year that add more and more uh, to the number of genomes that we've seen in various environmental samples. Um, and additionally, if you look at the tree of life as shown here, um, this is from 2016, so the parts that are a little out of data, but each of those red dots represent a, um, a taxonomy, a level of taxonomy that has no cultured representative. So we're not able to easily bring these into the lab and do some traditional microbial genetic studies to understand what each gene does. So our only chance of understanding what they do uh, currently is to annotate those genomes and figure out what they're capable of doing. Um, so we can't just go through spreadsheets or go through GenBank files to be able to do that. We need a better way to be able to build understanding of what these genomes are, what these organisms are capable of and what they could be doing in their specific environments. And that's why we developed this cool, this tool, cool tool called DRAM. And so our learning objectives today um, are first to conceptualize the challenges in assigning functions. So of course the uh, functions that we assign aren't perfect um, and don't give a exact representation of what that genome is capable of doing in a specific environment. Um, then we're gonna to work to familiarize all of you with uh, DRAM workflow. So if you're running DRAM on your own, uh, what does it do and how is it similar or different to other tools that already exist in the field? Um, then we're gonna talk about the DRAM outputs and how you can use that uh, to curate metabolism. So how you can go from what DRAM gives you to this mental model or these genome cartoons um, showing what microbes are capable of. Uh, and they're going to talk about how DRAM is a living annotation pipeline, how we're continuing to de develop DRAM and hopefully make it even better in the future. Um, and please ask questions using the Q&A feature. Um, Kayla and I will be switching off talking, uh, so we'll be monitoring that while the other one isn't talking, uh, and we'll try to answer all your questions. Um, also, to give a, you an idea of the format of this talk, so we're going to go through all of these learning objectives. Uh, then. After that, uh, we're going to take a little break in, in the resources uh, that were posted online um, in a little bit. I can post it in the chat as well. Um, we have provided a set of questions that can be answered by looking at the annotations and distillation output that's provided by DRAM. Um, and so after during that break, we'd like you to look through those questions and maybe try to answer a few of them based on the DRAM outputs that have per, been provided. Um, and then after the break, we're going to go through those uh, and show how you can answer each of these individual questions uh, using the outputs from DRAM. Um, and those answers will be included as part of the slides. So if you want to go through afterward and go through after this talk and go through and try to answer all these questions, um, we'll add the slides to that folder as well. And you'll also have the lecture able to watch. You'll, uh, you'll also be able to watch the lecture afterwards. So let's start with conceptualizing, chal conceptualizing challenges uh, in assigning potential gene function. So what, what does it mean? So when we're assigning a function to a gene, uh, well, to give an analogy, we can think of a genome as a recipe. Uh, so for here, we have an example of a, res a simple little recipe for chocolate chip cookies. Um, and so you can see we have individual uh, ingredients. We have the amounts that we need of each ingredient. And so we can just follow these instructions and be able to make some great chocolate chip cookies. Um, and so if we compare that to a genome, we can say that the recipe is like an entire genome. Um, and these each individual components, the individual ingredients are the genes that are present within it. And so if we were able to do perfect annotation, um, we'd be able to identify all of these ingredients and say exactly what they did. Um, so we'd be able to go through and just follow the recipe and make something great. And similarly, we could do that with the genome and know exactly what it does in an environment. But unfortunately, annotation is not perfect. And there's a few different issues that can pop up that I'm going to describe in the coming slides. Um, so first, uh, annotation can be nonspecific. So maybe uh, in this example, we can see that we have two different types of sugars uh, where if we had the full recipe, we'd know we needed three quarters of a cup of white sugar and three quarters of a cup of brown sugar. But maybe 
we there's some smudges on our recipe card um, and we can just see that there's three quarters a cup of two different types of sugar. We can't tell you exactly what type of sugar. It could be powdered sugar, brown, white, muscovado, some fancy, <laughs> some other fancy uh, sugar product. Uh, we just can't tell you exactly what it is. Similarly, uh, we all often can't provide an exact annotation to a gene. And similarly, you could imagine in a recipe that instead of three cups of flour, the recipe just tells you that you need three cups of some white solid powder. So we know about what it looks like. We know uh, it could be flour or baking soda or baking powder or salt or sugar. It's something that looks like that. And similarly with genes, we often find that uh, we've you can uh, do your annotation against the database and see that genes with similar sequences have been observed before, um, but those genes have been assigned function. There's been no biochemical studies to say exactly what that gene does. Um, so, hey, we've seen it before, but we have no idea what it does. So that's not gonna provide a ton of value when you're trying to understand genomic potential, at least from homology-based methods. Uh, and additionally, you can have cases where a gene is entirely unannotated. So in our, our case of annotation, um, this would be when you have a gene, you have this predicted protein sequence that you get from your bin um, or from your metagenome. Uh, then we search against all databases and we can't find anything like it. There's no hits from anything we've seen before. So in our recipe, this would be an example of we need three of something. Uh, we don't know if it's a solid or a liquid. We can't tell you anything about what it is. This is entirely new to us. So this would be very unhelpful if you're trying to make your chocolate chip cookies. Um, and so these problems also scale across when you're looking at a metagenome or you're looking at a collection of mags that were generated from a, a metagenomic sequencing sample because there you have many recipes, all of which likely have vague or incomplete ingredients lists. Um, and if you're not even able to get good bins, then you just have a list of ingredients from all the recipes and you can't even tell which specific recipe it was from. Um, so there's a lot of challenges to annotation um, that make it difficult, but we're still able to get some really good information about it. And we're, us and other groups are always working, working hard to make annotation better and make it so we can apply it better in more scenarios. So now I've told you the difficulties in assigning function, and now we're going to jump into understanding our tool, DRAM, that we designed to address some of these issues um, and how it works and how it compares to other tools. So DRAM, or Distilled and Refined Annotation of Metabolism, uh, is an annotation pipeline for microbial genomes. Um, so this is going to sound similar to other tools like I mentioned before. Um, so you're going to start with a FASTA file. These can either be from isolate genomes, metagenome assembled genomes, or bins, um, or metagenomic assemblies. Um, it's first going to call genes with Prodigal. So that's the tool we use to predict those amino acid sequences. Uh, then we're going to annotate those genes with a variety of databases. Uh, by default, DRAM is going to annotate with uh, be set up to annotate with PFAM, uh, KEG, Uniprot, uh, KZ via the DBCAN set of HMM models, uh, MRAPS for peptidases, as well as VOGDB to try to find viral elements uh, in bacterial genomes. Um, in addition to doing these um, annotation of protein coding genes, DRAM is also going to use tRNA scan SE to find tRNAs as well as BARNAP to find rRNAs. Uh, and it can also annotate with genes from user provided databases. So if you have a FASTA file uh, with genes that you're really interested in that aren't, don't tend to be covered well by the other databases DRAM uses, then you can throw those in there and get those annotations too. Um, Additionally, it can take information uh, about your bins. Um, this is specific, these tools are specifically designed for use with bins. Um, and it can take information from uh, GTDB for taxonomy or CheckM uh, for completeness and contamination. Dylan talked a little bit about CheckM last week, and Donovan Parks is going to be giving the talk next week about GTDB TK. So I'm excited to hear about that and learn more about how they're uh, producing that input that we take advantage of with DRAM. 
Um, but like I said before, the annotation step is not what makes DRAM unique. Um, we can compare DRAM to a variety of other tools here, and we can show that DRAM performs very well compared to those other tools. Um, so here, uh, when the heat map on the left, we're comparing DRAM to Proca, DFAST, and MetaERG. Um, and this is showing the different databases that each of these tools use. Um, so for example, all tools annotate against some subset of Uniprot. Uh, DRAM, by default, uh, annotates against the widest set of Uniprot compared to the other tools. Um, and you can see, for example, that both DRAM and MetaERG compare against PFAM, but then there's uh, other databases that are specific to DRAM uh, that we think provide interesting information that's really relevant when trying to understand the function of microbes uh, in a mag-based study. Um, and that is the that variety of databases reflected in the number of entries that are used by each tool as shown in the bar graph. In the upper right, you can see that DRAM has uh, the most with MetaERG, ju just a little bit behind it, where DFAST and PROCA uh, lag far behind in the number of entries they compare against. Um, but this does come at a cost of runtime. Um, this plot on the bottom right is showing the speed of each tool on both a uh, soil and silico data set, which Kayla is going to describe in a little bit, as well as on some HNP genomes. Uh, and we can see that MetaERG and DRAM uh, both take much longer to run than Proca and DFAST. Um, similar amounts of time and really just reflecting the number of entries in the databases that they annotate against. But the benefit of using all these databases and maybe sacrificing a little bit of that runtime uh, is the completeness that DRAM annotations give you. Um, so you can see in these bar graphs, we're showing on the far left the annotation count. So this is the number of genes which have uh, uh, annotation that we can link to some function. Um, so you can see that DRAM has the most with MetaERG just a little bit behind and DFAST and PROCA falling behind those. Um, but where DRAM is really different from these other tools is that hypothetical count. So this is our example from our recipe analogy. Uh, where we can say that it's that we can't maybe can't say it's uh, salt, but we can say it's a white powder. Or we can't say it's flour, but we can say it's a white powder. So these are genes that we know have been seen in other uh, sequence genomes or sequence metagenomes, but we can't assign a specific function to them. So these are going to be labeled as hypothetical. Uh, and DRAM really gives you all of those annotations. So we're going to tell you if it's a gene that's been seen before, but it doesn't have an assigned function. So. Uh, we're really giving you all that possible information that's going to come into account uh, later when we talk about the future directions that we're moving DRAM in. Um, and DRAM also gives you the lowest number of unannotated genes. Um, so in a lot of these other tools, uh, those hypothetical genes, those genes that DRAM sees as hypothetical are just going to be listed as unannotated. Um, but DRAM is very comparable to other tools in terms of what it does. It might give you more complete annotations, but it's not doing something totally different from what other tools are doing. And where it is giving you something completely new that other tools aren't doing um, is this distillation process and how DRAM distills annotations with a focus on function. Uh, and this is how we go beyond just having that GenBank file or that tab delimited file uh, with all the functions for each gene. So DRAM will give you that if you need to go into that level of depth but we're also going to give you two levels of distillation called the distillate and the product, uh, which further summarize what we're seeing in the annotation. So give you a more summarized view, a way you can really dive in uh, quickly and understand what the genomic potential of all the bins or metagenomes that you've annotated. Um, and Kayla's going to go into more depth on what those outputs are and how you can use them in a little bit. Um, additionally, um, we're not going to go into depth on DRAM V today, but if you have questions about it, we're happy to answer them uh, as part of answering questions at the end of the talk. Um, but we also have DRAM V for viral genomes. So DRAM V follows a very similar process through the annotation step to what DRAM does. Um, it adds a few extra databases, uh, including NCBI viral RefSeq. Um, and then a few extra steps where it's going to determine what we call an auxiliary score, which is a measure of how confident we are that this gene is actually viral and not just a host gene that was, for example, stuck onto the end of a contig uh, that was called as viral by whatever tool, tool you're using. Um, 
And we're also going to determine what, we're, what we call metabolic flags, uh, which let us know if we think this gene is metabolic in function, if this gene has already been seen before as an AMG, um, our auxiliary metabolic gene, um, as well as a few other things. And so then we're going to bring that all together uh, with the same distillation process with a real focus on AMGs in identifying these genes in viruses, which can have potential metabolic function. And so now I'm going to hand it off to Kayla to talk to you all about how you can take advantage of the information that DRAM gives. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, and then, okay. So can y'all see my slides? We're good? Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to, so Mike has talked to you a little bit about um, what, how DRAM works and what the pipeline actually is. And so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about how you can discern metabolism from the DRAM outputs um, and what all these DRAM outputs represent. Okay, so specifically today, I'll be talking to you about the metabolism portion of DRAM. And so I just need to, okay, how do I move? Oh, okay, I'm ready. Okay, to demonstrate this, um, or so, so today I'm going to talk to you about the metabolism part of DRAM. And so to demonstrate how the metabolism portion works, um, we're going to use soils as an example. And so for this, we chose soil relevant genomes to showcase DRAM capabilities. Um, and we chose soils because of the vast metabolic diversity harbored in soils. Um, and so in this figure, I'm showing you, um, I'm highlighting the ecosystem processes that microorganisms carry out. Um, and so this includes things like methanogenesis, methane oxidation, and denitrification. And so um, you can use, utilize DRAM to really profile all of these biochemically or biogeochemical processes that are important in soils. And so for this, we pulled several genomes for biologically relevant processes that also accounted for divergent lineages. And so for the rest of this lecture, um, we'll be using a set of 15 genomes to represent um, these processes. And so I would like to note that this data set is not meant to represent an entire soil microbial community, but was really selected to highlight the metabolisms that you can understand in DRAM. Okay, so we ran these 15 genomes from isolates and metagenomes through JRAM um, annotation to obtain annotations for each gene in each genome from each of the six different databases that Mike discussed. Um, and so from there, we then used DRAM to distill these annotations. And so I would like to note here that DRAM outputs a large number of files and all of them are linked. So Mike talked about the raw and the distillate and the product and you can, um, each of those are linked. Um, and I'll talk to you about how you can sort of backtrack through all of these um, outputs and as we go through the talk. And so in your practice data set, um, in the resources, we did provide um, each of the um, levels here and all the files that come out of DRAM. Okay, so as Mike told you, the most refined level of DRAM annotation is the product. And so this is really going to provide you with the most succinct metabolic summary of your genomes or mags. Um, then the distillate is one level up. And so this is gonna give you a little bit more information on what you see in the product. So what specifically the genes are called and how many per genome. And then lastly, one level up again is the raw. And so this gives you everything. It's every annotation for every gene, um, all the information you could ever want about your genomes and their annotations. <laughs> Okay, so to go through these genomes, these 15 soil genomes, we're going to work backwards through the distillation level. So we're going to start with the most refined, which is the product. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is the product. And so in your um, resources page, this is going to be called product.html. And so this is what it looks like. So you get this heat map and it is interactive when you're in the HTML version. This is just the static image. 
And so for this, what's important to note is that there are different levels of completion with this heat map. So there's a pathway completion, there's a subunit completion, and then there's presence absence. And so each of these kind of mean different things in, in genome land. And so we're gonna discuss what each means um, now. Okay, so for pathway completion, this considers alternate genes and alternate pathways. And so it gives you the percent coverage of a path with the largest percent of genes present. Um, so as an example, I'm showing you glycolysis, which can have nine or 10 steps depending on the route. So you can see at this step six, that kind of goes out, um, you can skip a step there. And so DRAM will calculate all the routes and then report the coverage that is the best coverage for that particular process. So in this case, it would have reported 100% because for one of the particular routes, this genome has all um, components or all steps. Um, DRAM also reports subunit completion. So for parts of the electron transport chain, um, subunit completion can be really important. And so this um, becomes really important when you're inferring metabolism. If I'm going to say that this genome has an NADH dehydrogenase, it matters if it has all subunits or just three. And it might even matter what subunits of the NADH dehydrogenase are getting annotated. Um, so for example, having specific subunits, E, F, and G, um, and annotated as NADH dehydrogenase could be indicative that this is actually a trimeric hydrogenase. And so these are things to look for and why we provide subunit completion rather than just um, you have one subunit of the NADH dehydrogenase. Um, for presence absence, um, you can see this is the presence absence portion of the DRAM product. And so some of these require specific um, single genes and some require multiple genes. And so that information can be gleaned from actually scrolling over in the interactive mode. You can see how we're calling them and what genes need to be present. Um, if you're looking for like a static spreadsheet type of thing to say, you know, what am I calling this on? You can download that information from the DRAM GitHub. Okay. Okay, so now that we know a little bit how DRAM compiles all this information into specific metabolisms, we can start going through these genomes. Um, but there are two things that I would like to note. Um, I keep talking about how this heat map is interactive. So I did take a static screenshot. So if you mouse over that um, product HTML um, that you've clicked on, you can see that um, different boxes will start popping up. So you'll mouse over a different a specific box. And so in this case, I've taken a screenshot of the Dechloromonas genome. And it is telling me that this genome has the potential for denitrification and DRAM is calling it present based on the fact that it has a NAR-G. Um, the second thing about these heat maps is that these, um, I do want to mention that they're scalable to thousands of genomes. So Mike mentioned that genome databases are growing and growing and growing. And so we really wanted to make a tool that could be applied um, to thousands of genomes at once. Okay, so when first working through a set of genomes or one genome in particular, we're first interested in how the organisms in a given environment are making a living. So our first question is, what type of energy generation metabolisms are encoded by my genome? And so we can start with the DRAM product to answer this question. Um, so the first key way for microbes to make energy is through respiration. And we can see this in the DRAM product output. Um, so what we would look for in that DRAM product output, output would be um, a full electron transport chain, a near complete TCA cycle, as well as the potential to use external electron acceptors, so things like nitrate. Um, and so this would be indicative of respiration and ATP production um, via oxidative phosphorylation. And so if we go back to our product, oh, I switched that. Okay, the second way is through fermentation. So this would be an absence of the pieces I just mentioned. So things like the NADH dehydrogenase, the TCA cycle, and external electron acceptors would be missing from those genome annotations. And so now if we go back to the product, we can actually see um, these things that I've outlined here. And so what type of energy generation metabolisms are encoded in my genomes? Um, if we first look for respiration, um, we can see that the ones I've blocked out in red boxes 
have the potential to respire. And so there we're looking at, does it have a pretty complete TCA cycle? Does it have each of these pieces of the electron transport chain? Um, and so we can say from this analysis that 10 of the genomes within our soil data set have the potential to respire. Okay, so then our next question is, okay, so if I have organisms that can respire, what is their energy source? Is it a chemical? Is it, is it light? Um, and this can also be gleaned from this uh, DRAM product. Um, so do we see the potential for respiration with oxygen, nitrate, sulfate? Do we see photosynthesis? And so these things can all be found on the DRAM product where you can see, see oxygen here. These are the different nitrate electron acceptors sulfate, and then we have the photosystems. And so you can start to diagnose sort of what, how your genomes are making a living and what they need um, in the environment to live. What's their genomic potential? Okay, what about other metabolisms? We might also be interested in methanogenesis. And so um, the key functional gene for methanogenesis is MCRA. And so this is highlighted on our product. So you can see in the methane block that that first row or column is the functional gene. So from this data set, we can see that one organism has the potential um, to carry out methanogenesis in the environment because it has an MCRA. And then from there, you might also be interested in how this organism has the potential to produce methane, but what substrates can it use? And so you can um, kind of scan over and see, oh, okay, this one has the potential for acetate. It can also probably use trimethylamine, dimethylamine, methanol, and maybe CO2. Okay. Um, another thing organisms need to live is carbon. So organisms also need carbon to make a living. And we can get this information from the DRAM product as well. So we have things like short chain fatty acid conversions. So can it use acetate, lactate, butyrate, propionate? And then we also have um, kzymes. So these calls in the DRAM product allow users to profile carbohydrate substrate utilization um, for input genomes. And so you can see here that um, for all of our 15 genomes, many of them have the potential to degrade polyphenolics. Um, and so you can sort of mouse over and see how we're making those calls. Um, and I do want to stop on the kzymes because um, a lot of manual creation went into diagnosing what um, carbohydrates a genome can use. And so DRAM has a set of rules for annotating carbohydrate k -dezymes and assigning them specific substrates. And so what are k -dezymes? These are enzymes that degrade or modify glycosidic bonds. And this is for large carbon polymers. So things like pectin, xyloglucan, and hemicellulose. Um, and so to annotate these kzymes, we use dbcan2. And so this gives you enzyme family level information for potential hits. Um, and so then DRAM parses the annotations from dbcan into substrate level calls for each genome. So this is something that's provided outside of dbcan. This is unique to DRAM. Um, and so what this means is that we were able to classify the dbcan calls that are things like GH4, GH15 into things like pectin or xyloglucan to really get at, okay, my, bug, my genome has a GH15, but what does that really mean in terms of the carbon um, utilization? And so this expert curation and logic housing and DRAM was built by um, Phil Pope and his team. And so for the product, the DRAM product, I briefly mentioned that for some of the um, calls in the DRAM product presence absence, you had to have multiple genes. And so kzymes are an example of that. So in order to be considered to be able to grade a specific substrate in the product heat map, a genome must have a um, backbone cleaving kzyme and an oligo cleaving kzyme. Um, and so we did this to really minimize um, false positives. And so what we require for something like pectin, it needs to be able to cleave both the backbone and the uh, side chain. Okay, so with the product, we can already start building out those genome cartoons that Mike was referring to. 
And so what I'm showing you here is the Dichloromonas genome cartoon. And you can see that we can, with the product, we can put the electron transport chain on here. We can get to some of these external electron acceptors. We can start to add some of the um, Kzyme, so polyphenolics, also glycolysis, um, and those pathways for carbon utilization. Um, but I did mention that the distillate is up a level, okay? So this is a higher level view of what other metabolisms might be present, not just how they're making a living, but things like transporters, flagella. Um, and this stuff is found in the distillate. And so um, those are for that particular file in your resources, it's called metabolism underscore summary. And so, um, you can start to build out other parts of this genome cartoon. So we can add the transporters, we can add the flagella, we can add different parts of the carbon cycle that aren't profiled on um, the, within the um, product. Okay, so the other figure I have up here is the DRAM distillate. And so I, as I told you, this distillate is called metabolism summary. And so if you open that file, what you can see is that there's um, five tabs. So there's an energy tab, a transporters tab, a miscellaneous tab, a carbon utilization and an organic nitrogen. And so we've broken out all of this type of metabolism into different um, tabs there so that if, Kayla, I'm really interested in flagella. So you would want to go to the miscellaneous tab or I'm really interested in what transporters my organism has. You can already filter down the information and go to the transporters tab. Um, and then also what's shown here is like within each tab, there's also headers where you can sort. So I'm really interested in sulfur. So you can go to the energy tab and then you can just sort by sulfur and you can see everything that there is to do with sulfur in your genomes. Okay. Um, and then if we go one level higher, um, this is the raw. So this contains all of the information, every annotation for every gene and every genome. And so you can add other things to your genome cartoon that maybe are specific to your study. So things like multi-heme C-type cytochromes are profiled, um, different carbon substrates. And so this is what the raw looks like. So you can imagine this is what we started with, but we can, the real strength of DRAM is that we have um, curated the metabolism so that you can build out most of this genome cartoon and then go to the raw for things that you specifically are interested in. Okay. Now putting it all together, I mentioned that all of these pieces are linked. Um, and so it's really important to know how, how to link them. And so what I'm done here is just, these are snapshots of each of the pieces. Um, so the product, the distillate and the raw. And so let's say, for example, you are very interested in um, bin 45's starch utilization. So you might be wondering, okay, well, how did DRAM call starch utilization? And so um, you can see here, this is the box, it's green, it called it, it does have the potential for starch utilization. And then you mouse over and you can see, okay, it called it based on GH15, GH13, GH133, and GH57. It does have a starch backbone cleavage and an oligo cleavage. So that is why it got called positive in the product. But let's say I don't really know that much about glycoside hydrolases and I just wanna investigate further. So which GH15, GH13, GH133, GH57, which of those is the backbone and which is the oligo? Um, and so you can go then to the distillate and search for these specific glycoside hydrolases. So this is on the carbon utilization tab in the um, distillate. And so you can search for these, I've highlighted them in yellow. And then each column in your distillate is a bin. And so we cared about bin 45. And so you can see that there are ones here because there's a copy of each type of these glycoside hydrolases here. And then from there, you can also see, okay, so we, DRAM is calling GH13 starch backbone cleavage and GH57 starch backbone cleavage. So, okay, now I know that my genome has two backbone cleavage and two oligo cleavage for starch. Okay, well, so let's say, now I wanna know where in the genome it is. Are these all co-located um, on the genome? And so for that, we can go to the raw. And so what you can see here, these are um, under the CASIS column. Um, these are the specific glycoside hydrolase calls. 
Um, and then these are, I sorted this by bin 45, so I can see all the CASI hits for bin 45. And you can see that these are actually all on different scaffolds. So scaffold 1950, 25, scaffold, so this is 1950, the 19, that's the scaffold, and then 25 is the gene number. So this is, none of these are co-located on the genomes. Um, and then if you wanna even take it a step further, in DRAM, you can go to the strainer. Okay, so that's great. I have these glycoside hydrolases, but let's say I wanna in investigate these glycoside hydrolases further. I wanna see where they're located in the cells. So I wanna use PSORT B, or I wanna use FIRE to see what the active sites look like. And so what you can do is now use strainer to um, pull each of these glycoside hydrolase sequences from your genome. So um, Basically, you can put in the identifier. So I want all the glycoside hydrolases from bin 45. So then it gives you a FASTA file and now you can put it in and put it into PSORT B. Um, and so that is how each of these things sort of all link together um, to really provide how um, you can analyze your genomes um, at different steps, whatever level you're on, you can just go through um, each step. Okay. Now I'm gonna hand it off to Mike. Great, thanks Kayla. I left a question for in the Q&A about how you create your beautiful genome cartoons. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so now you've gotten a great overview of why annotation can be hard, um, what DRAM does to try to ameliorate some of those issues um, and how it's different from other annotation tools, as well as how you can use the DRAM annotations to go from that big table of what these genes are to uh, representation, even a visual representation of what the genomic potential of a specific genome is. Uh, so now we're gonna talk to you a little bit about how DRAM is a living annotation pipeline in the future directions we have and what we're working on now. So the first step is that DRAM annotation is expanding. Um, we've, since DRAM was published last year, we've already added a few different things to the DRAM distillate and we're working actively right now to add more to the DRAM product. Um, so this is gonna be covering new metabolisms such as phenolics degradation, uh, bile salt metabolism, methyl methylated amine metabolism. Um, and this is all getting added to the distillate and we're working really hard uh, to figure out how we can get this all added to the product too. So that say you can choose, uh, or you can say, I really care about gut systems. I know methylamines and bile salts are really important. So I wanna make sure that those show up in my product when I'm investigating mags from uh, gut samples. And so we're working on ways that you can specify those things that you see in the product. So you can see those bile acids and methylated amines, but you're in the gut. You don't care about photosynthesis. You don't need to see the photosynthesis part of uh, the DRAM product. So we're working on making this more fully customizable so you can only get the information you really need and have that really concentrated experience of seeing what you care about. Um, and then also building in user-defined outputs. So in terms of both doing that kind of filtering based on the relevant ecosystem that you're studying, um, as well as bringing in your custom databases. Um, so right now, DRAM can only distill uh, with, e with ID identifiers that DRAM knows how to look for. Um, so if you're annotating with KEG, um, DRAM already has features where you can add a custom distillate. Um, so you can say, you can build your own modules that you wanna see in that big multi-tab Excel spreadsheet uh, that Kayla described. So you can essentially add your own new tabs on there for what you care about, but that has to be built on identifiers from KEG or PFAM um, or KZ or other databases that DRAM already knows to look for. Uh, so we're working on building in custom databases so you can not only have custom modules, but can have those custom modules based on uh, the custom databases that you're building um, that you that characterize metabolisms or other functionality that you really care about. Um, we're also working on making it so DRAM annotations can lead to GEMS, so genome-enabled uh, metabolic models. So making it so that you can do your annotation with DRAM um, 
and then make it so I can build a flux balance analysis model of what's going on in this genome or potentially even what's going on in this whole microbiome. Um, so we've done this by integrating a DRAM into the KBase platform. Um, so there's currently a DRAM beta app up there now uh, where you can take your mag that you either generated within KBase or generated outside of KBase and then upload it. Uh, then you can annotate with DRAM and you'll get that full interactive product. So everything that Kayla described to you today, you'll be able to pull down all those files or interact with them live, with them live within your browser. And KBase is free to use, so anyone can go up on there and do it. So you're not limited by potential server requirements. Um, so you might not have access to a server that is uh, has enough RAM or is fast enough for DRAM to be useful for you. Well, you can go into KBase uh, and be able to use it there in a point and click environment. Um, and with that DRAM app that exists now, uh, there's limited ability to go into flux balance analysis models. Um, right now it's just grabbing uh, KOs and using, using that to build the models, but KO doesn't give you the perfect coverage. We really need to be able to bring in other identifiers to build better models. Um, and I'm working on building uh, an app which can do that now. Um, and so hopefully a beta version of that app will be released this week. Um, and then I'm hoping a release version of that can happen within the next month. Um, and then we'll be able to really build good models uh, within KBase with DRAM compared to say the RAS standards already built into DRAM, build models uh, and then be able to build community models of what's going on and how these mags that you've found contribute functions uh, that are important within these techniques. And then we're also expanding what annotation is to DRAM. Um, so right now, DRAM is based on these two types of searches, either a BLAST style search, which DRAM uses MMCX2 for, or an HMM style search, uh, which DRAM uses HMM search for. Um, but those require some level of sequence similarity to say that those two genes are similar, and therefore you can transfer the function from the known gene to the unknown gene. Um, but there's also non-homology based models, um, uh, methods of annotation, I should say. Um, so this can include things like curation of gene neighborhoods. So looking for uh, genes that are co-clustered together within a scaffold, looking at the shared functions or shared pathways involved uh, with the genes there and using that to say, oh, I have these three genes, uh, all of which are involved, uh, are all of which are adjacent steps in the same pathway. And then I have one other gene next to them that I wasn't able to sign an annotation to, um, either because it's hypothetical or it's completely unannotated. Well, if I can then potentially, um, if I have enough evidence, Say that maybe this gene is also involved in that pathway and use that to do more targeted searches and maybe go out into a tool like fire uh, like kayla mentioned to build a model and maybe that's a way you can build an, an understanding of what that gene could be doing um, we can also look for co-occurrence information uh, so look for co-occurrence of genes across uh, different mags or different metagenomes um, in wider data sets and be able to say uh, this gene, this gene of unknown function is always correlated with this gene that's involved in uh, mannose degradation. So maybe this gene is also involved in mannose degradation. And you can bring together across, maybe it's in a gene neighborhood and it's co-correlated. So you can build up that picture of should this gene have been assigned this annotation, but we just weren't able to do that based on our, our homology-based methods. Uh, and finally, for non-homology-based annotation, as well as just making this tool more useful for more people, is omics integration. So how can we bring in metatranscriptomics data, metabolomics data, um, both in the context of models, as well as just knowing what genes are there, but also are they being expressed? Are they being uh, transcribed? Are the potential products of those uh, enzymes present in your metabolomics data or the substrates? Um, so we're working uh, to integrate these uh, this biochemical backbone uh, into DRAM that will allow us to build these pathways and show you not only what's there in your mag, but is there other evidence that that gene is actually active and not just present. And so DRAM is uh, publicly available. Um, we encourage people to check it out. Um, it's You can install DRAM in a server environment through Bioconda. Um, it's a quick and easy, it's pretty easy to install, it takes a little bit longer to set up with all these databases, um, but not too much trouble, I hope. 
Um, DRAM is also available, like I said, through KBase. Um, so this is a point and click interface. So if you're not comfortable working on a server or you don't have access to a server uh, that's powerful enough to run DRAM, then you can go into KBase. You can do everything from going from your reads uh, to bins, uh, like was described last week, um, or just start with importing your bins directly to KBase, then do your annotation with DRAM there. You'll get within the KBase website the interactive product that you can scroll through and hover over just like you would uh, if you'd ran DRAM on your server, um, as well as that's where the integration into modeling is going to be happening, at least at first, um, with goals to make that uh, possible on the server on a server environment later. Um, and we're also working really hard on getting uh, DRAM working in Cybers. Uh, this will be really great um, as uh, ben Boldick will talk about a little bit uh, later in this course or in this webinar series about the Veromics tools. So that way you'll be able to uh, run DRAM V, especially within Cybers, and be able to see run your full Veromics pipeline within that environment. Um, and DRAM is public, uh, public, posted publicly on GitHub. So anyone who wants to look at the code or install um, some development versions of DRAM, make feature suggestions, we also have documentation available there. So if you want to learn more about uh, external version of DRAM, it's possible through the GitHub page. Ah. Um, and so of course we have lots of acknowledgements because uh, Kayla and I couldn't just sit alone in a dark room and build DRAM. Um, it required a lot of different work from a lot of different people. Um, so everyone in the Writing Lab who provided um, both their metabolism knowledge as well as their knowledge of how to use annotation pipelines and what they wanted out of a tool like this. Um, uh, everyone in the Sullivan lab who helped out uh, beta testing DRAM as well as really push forward DRAM V and made it so that we could develop everything that went into DRAM V. Um, members at uh, Argonne National Lab as well as the KBase team are the ones who have helped us with uh, building DRAM into metabolic models and getting DRAM working in KBase. So it wouldn't be possible without them. Um, as well as uh, Simon Rue at JGI, who also helped with DRAMV, uh, Phil Pope and Sabina, who helped out with all the K all the KZYME stuff. So I think, do we want to take questions now if there's extra questions, or do we want to? Or, okay, yeah. So we'll take questions now, and then we'll jump into describing a data set and the questions that you can answer with DRAM on that data set. Um, Mike, is the DRAM in KBase under beta versions if people are searching it? Yes. Um, okay. So currently there's only a beta version of DRAM. So when you go into the uh, app cat, so you can either go into the app catalog and select that you want to see beta apps in addition to release apps, or if you're in the normal narrative and you're searching for apps, um, in that bottom left little pane there, there's a little uh, R and that stands for release. You can click on that till you see a B for beta, then search for DRAM under the annotation tools and you'll be able to find it there. Um, and then the other thing about KBase, you can download the raw products from KBase as well, right? Correct, yeah. The, every one of the files that normally comes out of DRAM is there uh, in KBase. So you'll have to download them and then open you can sorry you can see the product at html live in the browser uh, when you're doing that but all the other ones there are available for you to download and then look at on your own computer um okay and then the other thing is when curating gene neighborhoods from metagenome data which is best to use context or scaffolds or can it be done on mags and sags um i think you can do geno neighborhoods on all of these things um but just be conscious of when you're doing a gene neighborhood, especially a comparison. If you're compares, comparing like isolate genomes to mags, just be wary of the completion. So more complete versus less complete. Yeah, and if you're on the end of a contig, especially. So if your gene neighborhood overlaps at the end of a contig, you might be missing part of that gene neighborhood just because that contig and your assembly broke there. So you weren't able to see it, not because it's not there in the real genome that this contig is representing. Um, and a question I wanted to make sure we addressed live that came up in the Q&A uh, was asking if you can use DRAM on more than just mags. And the answer is yes. Uh, you can use DRAM on uh, bins or mags. You can use it on isolate genomes. Uh, you can use it on full metagenomes. Um, there's tools that are built in, like taking in the CheckM and GTDB information. So that's going to be specific to annotating mags. 
um, and that's going to all show up in your uh, genome stats part of the distillate. Um, but if you annotate full metagenomes, you can still get that full product, and you'll just have to remember that you're seeing a view of uh, how that would look across uh, an entire metagenome and not within a single genome. Uh, and we just had a new question come in. Um, could you expand a bit on how to integrate proteomics data? Uh, so yeah, I have a few ideas on how you could do that. Uh, we've worked with collaborators right now, um, uh, and we're working on a paper right now with one of our collaborators publishing on how we, uh, part of it is how we use DRAM to do the annotation. So we had, I should say, we had paired metagenomics in, prote in metaproteomics data. Um, so we were able to uh, look at the assemblies of those metagenes as well as the bins and annotate those with DRAM. And so with DRAM, you'll get those predicted uh, amino acid sequences as well as the functions that were assigned to those. And then we use that as the database for when we were annotating our metaproteome. Um, and so therefore we can go and say, um, did we see this predicted protein in our uh, proteome? Uh, and what function did it have? What is the taxonomy of the bin that it came from? Uh, and that's information you can get with DRAM. Um, we've also done some more manual uh, trials. So the way the DRAM distillation process works is, or so the way DRAM works is when you run it, you run an annotate step, and then you run a separate distillation step, um, which primarily takes into account this annotations tab delimited file that has all that raw information. Um, so what you could potentially do with your proteomics is you could run your proteomics assay, run your uh, annotation of the proteins that you saw there. Um, and then you could filter that DRAM annotations file based on whether or not you saw those genes in your metaproteome. And then you could distill that filtered annotations file. And then you'd be getting that same view of the DRAM product uh, but only seeing which proteins were actively expressed in your sample. So we're uh, working on building tools to make that a more automated process uh, now. And then the longer with the longer term view of having built in ways to visualize pathways with information about if genes are being expressed or not. Okay, I think um, we can move on to the next um, step. So what we've done is sort of put together a worksheet based on an HMP data set, which Mike's going to discuss the HMP data set in a few slides. And then we'll take like a 20 minute break for people to kind of try to answer those questions with the DRAM annotations that we provided. And then Mike and I will go through the answers to those questions and where you can find those answers in the DRAM um, outputs. Um, so I'll let Mike take it away. Yeah. And we definitely don't expect you to answer all like 17 questions or whatever it is during the 20 minutes. Um, I'd recommend you flip through or look through the questions, think about which ones are interesting to you and then go through and see if you can answer those, but we'll provide the answers to all of them. And so you can come back to this later as a resource afterward. So DRAM in the gut microbiome. So uh, when the initial uh, large release of the Human Microbiome Project data came out back in 2012, um, one of their primary findings uh, was uh, what's shown here. So in the top, we're looking at two different stacked bar plots um, where each column represents a sample um, and each colored bar in the top graph represents a taxonomic unit um, here at the phylum level. And in the bottom graph, each represents um, a category of functional annotation for a gene, in this case, from COG. Uh, and so one of the uh, interesting findings that they saw here was that you see this pretty wide variability in the taxonomy, um, so which um, the taxonomy of the, of the bacteria which are present in those samples. Um, largely driven by a trade-off between the firmicutes in gray and the bacteroid EDs uh, in blue. Um, but then when you compare that to the functional profile shown at the bottom, those are a lot more static. So people were very surprised to see that there's little variability, at least at this very high level, um, 
in the functional potential of these metagenomes. So maybe there's different bacteria there, but in the end, it's the same set of functions that are present. And so we wanted to dig into that more with DRAM um, because with the DRAM distillate, we have these categories ranging from that really high level of, is this gene part of energy, uh, transporters, miscellaneous carbon utilization or organic nitrogen uh, processing. Um, so we can do a similar thing to what they did on the high level with COG, we can do with DRAM uh, and that's shown on the left here. So this is, shown, this is a subset of the same samples that were included uh, in the figure from the previous slide. And we see at that high level, we see that general uh, static nature of these. So there's not a huge amount of variability between sample or across samples. When we look at this high level. But then what we found was when you dig in further, um, you dig into these lower levels of the DRAM distillate, um, you can see much more variability in what's going on. For example, if you dig into carbohydrate backbone cleavage, so looking specifically at those casines which are involved in backbone cleavage for a uh, variety of these possible substrates, you see a lot more variability. In fact, you see a three times difference uh, in the abundance of these casines across samples with somewhere none of these casines are that abundant to ones where a lot of them are very abundant. And so DRAM really enables you to get a deeper look into the metabolisms that are present in these gut metagenomes, much more than if you just annotated with COG or looked at some high level functionality. And then Kayla, do you wanna jump in and run through these files? Okay, so what you'll find in, oh, sorry, it's my, my dog. Um, so if you want to um, download the question, so there's a, um word doc hold on mike please. yep so um and i think i can post in the chat a link if people haven't seen it it's under the resources page uh for the webinar uh there's a, a word file with this uh, cheat sheet of what all the files are as well as the questions that you can answer using this data set yeah and so while you're trying to answer these we'll be live in the chat. So if questions come up, just go ahead and post them in, but we will go through all the answers um, in about 20 minutes. So just keep your question where um, you could find the information for those questions. And I'll let Mike go first. Cool. So the first question we asked is, um, if you go into this data set, uh, how many mags have a quality of greater than 95%? and less than 5% contamination. Uh, so the way that I went through and answered this question uh, was I went into the genome stats.tsv file. So this is gonna include everything from the genome name, uh, the number of contigs, taxonomy, cleanest contamination, as well as your uh, non-coding RNAs that we look for. Um, so I was able to go through that. Um, I opened it up in Excel. I did some sorting so that I only included uh, bacteria with greater than 95% uh, completion. Um, luckily, when I did that, we had no bacteria that were less than 5% contamination uh, and was able to find that there was 19 different bacteria which met these standards. Um, Mike, we have a question in the chat where um, we do not report currently the number of base pairs per bin, right? We don't, um, but that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. Um, that's something we can add. Yeah, we we uh, provide number of scaffolds. I know I already have it on my list to do to add N50 in there too, but total assemble length and other features would be helpful in there as well. Thanks for that suggestion. Uh, then the next question was how many bins contain a 16S R RNA fragment, um, and what tool does DRAM use to generate this information? Um, so 16S is really interesting and people often want to find those in their bins, but unfortunately 16S genes are really hard to assemble. So a lot of the times you don't are assemble and bin. So a lot of times you don't get them in there. Um, so for the bins, we're, so I was able to go into that again, same file, the genome stats.tsv file. Um, this time I filtered it by the uh, 16S RRNA column. Uh, so then I was able to see that we had six different bins, which had at least one copy of the 16S uh, RRNA gene. Um, 
And you can see, for example, there with that top one, that GCF, lots of zeros, 16. Um, so that one has two 16S RNA genes present. So DRAM will even tell you if there's more than one there. Um, and then the tool that DRAM uses to get that information uh, uses a tool called BARNAP uh, to do that, which is uh, developed by a first time semen. Then the next question was, how many tRNAs does bin 94 contain? Uh, so then we're staying in our uh, genomestats.tsv file. Uh, then we're going to scroll through, uh, and we can see that each of these each of the rows is labeled with a genome name. So I went down to bin 94, uh, and I was able to see that in that tRNA count column, there's a 12. So therefore, there is 12 different tRNAs within that bin. Uh, and then kind of building on that, what's the highest quality mag and why is it the highest quality? Um, we use the standards, uh, the MEMAG standards that were uh, outlined in the Bowers et al. paper um, to determine what's a good bin and what's a low, medium, or high quality bin. Um, so I was able to use the column that already exists in the genome stats file called assembly quality. Um, and filter down to only the high quality and we only had one high one really high quality bin. Um, so that's what I consider to be the highest quality mag. Um, so that's bin 42. Uh, and I think that's the highest quality mag because of the Bowers at all standards. Um, and so we can see that the completeness is very high uh, at uh, over 93% and the contamination is very low at less than 1%. In um, this bin also has a representative of every one of the rRNA genes and 45 tRNAs. So it seems to have a really full complement of everything we'd expect to see in a completed genome. Uh, next is what is the worst quality mag uh, and why is it the worst quality? Um, so this is more arguable. Um, there's not, we didn't have one mag that was like 200% contamination and 0% completion or anything like that. Um, so when I went through it, um, I ended up choosing uh, bin 27 as the one with the lowest are uh, with the worst quality. This because it has the lowest contamination or lowest completeness of all of our bins. Um, uh, but it also has no rRNAs and very few tRNAs. So things that we would expect a complete genome to always have. Um, it does have low contamination. So I think you could argue that bin 11 is also one of the worst ones with its contamination at point or 2.35. Um, but uh, we do have to note that for this data set, we already filtered um, to greater than 50% completeness in, uh, oh, I flipped those, I'll, flip those. I'll fix that when we put these slides up. Um, it should be greater than 50% completeness and less than 10% contamination, um, which are the standards outlined in the Bowers et al. Uh, paper for to be at least medium quality. Um, and then how many genera are represented in this sample um, is a total of 61. So like if we go back uh, to a previous slide, uh, we can see we have this column taxonomy in the genome stats file. I didn't want to go through all, I think it's 94 bins and count how many <laughs> uh, genera that we saw. Uh, so I use Python to do it. Um, and so there was 61 total there, and you could also do it manually with R or another scripting language if you wanted to know. Answer this question on this data set or on your own data set. And then the next question is kind of looking more holistically at genome quality. So when we have all these mags, we have these scores of how good they seem to be. Uh, how should we consider this when we're looking at the functional annotations? So not just how good has this been, but how can I interpret uh, my functional annotations in light of this? Um, so here's this kind of longer answer that I'll read out. Um, so if a genome is very complete, then we're more confident that we have covered its full functional potential, whereas in a more incomplete bin, if a gene is missing, we might be more confident in saying that that gene is missing, but, not, but that doesn't mean it's not in the genome. Um, because you always need to remember 
these bins, these mags aren't perfect representations. They're not fully closed genomes of exact strains from your environment. So just because you don't see a gene in your mag, even though it's 99% complete, um, it, that gene still could be there in the real sample. So you have to be really cautious when you're interpreting the absence of a gene. Um, and then uh, continuing uh, for a higher contamination bin, we might be more suspect of functional annotations that seem out of the ordinary in that bin. Um, so to go back to my example I used before of photosynthesis. So if we see a photosynthesis gene in our gut microbiome sample, uh, and that comes from a bin that has higher contamination, we might be less confident that that gene should really be in that bin since there's not a lot of sunlight going on, at least in my gut. And that's all on genome stats, so I'll pass it over to Kayla. Okay, so for um, question eight, um, a key feature of DRAM is the module summary. Uh, so look at the TCA cycle for all of your bins, estimate how many mags have two or less steps in the TCA cycle. Um, so there's, I've got kind of two ways to answer this. So you could um, use your product.html and scroll over. Um, so what I've done here is it's a screenshot. And so you can see that um, you, how many steps are present um, in the TCA cycle and then how many how many steps there are in the TCA cycle and then how many are present in my genome. And so you can get at this question from there. Um, another key, fee another part of DRAM is that uh, we got feedback that um, it would be really nice if you had this heat map in a um, Excel form or a TSV form. And so we built a product.tsv. Um, and so what that represents is really just a TSV of that heat map. So you can go through and see what those exact percentages are. Um, and if you have 500 genomes, you might not want to scroll over the heat map and count everyone that has two out of eight steps. And so to answer this question, I went to the products.tsv um, and sorted by the um, completion in the TCA cycle column and counted um, that we have, I believe it was 61, but my thing is showing up. Sorry. 63, it says on the slide. 63, yeah. I, can, I knew it was in the 60s. So yeah, um, you can go through and get that information, information that way. So two kind of ways. Um, okay, we can go to the next one. Okay, so for the electron transport chain, completion is not about steps, but um, about how complete an enzyme complex is. So what criteria do you think makes an enzyme complete? Um, and so I just wrote this answer out. It's important to note that having a single gene in a multi-subunit complex or a single gene in a multi-step pathway is not strong support for metabolic potential. So when we're going to diagnose how a genome makes a living in an environment, we really wanna have multiple um, pieces of evidence that point to the same thing. So I have, you know, five subunits of an NADH dehydrogenase, and I have most of the TCA cycle, and I have uh, external electron acceptors, potential for those. So looking for each piece of evidence is really important rather than just relying on, I have one subunit from a multi-subunit um, enzyme. Uh, and so that is that. And we can go to the next one. Okay, so for today, let's assume enzyme complexes need at least 50% of the subunits to be functional. Um, which genomes seem to use aerobic respiration in energy production. And so again, you could use your product heat map. If you have a small number of genomes, you can mouse over and see how many of your genomes have a complete or partially complete NADHG hydrogenase based on 50%. Um, and then you can look for the cytochrome. So um, here, what I've done is for the product.tsv. Um, so this is the static version of that heat map. I sorted by the, um, the completion of the NADHG hydrogenase complex one, um, and then look to also see if it has um, cytochrome um, BD. And so you can see that 11 bins in our sample have the potential to respire using oxygen. Okay, question, okay. Um, so beyond oxygen, examine nitrogen, sulfur, and other reductases. So you can go to the um, presence-absence 
portion of the heat map to answer these questions. Um, and so in the gut, this is easy to do using this product HTML because there's not a ton of them. You can imagine in soil, these might be lit up all over the place if you had 80 bins. Um, but for this purposes, we can easily see, okay, nitrate to nitrite is the most represented um, in our bins. We also see dissimilatory sulfate reduction, um, but no other um, reductases. Um, and there is no photosynthesis, getting back to Mike's point on looking for things that might be out of place. Um, okay, question 12. Um, do you have the key functional gene for methanogenesis? Um, what methanogenic substrates might this organism be able to use based on its genomic potential? Um, and so it does look like we do have one methanogen in this gut, um, these list of gut genomes. And you can see that because it has the key functional gene, which is MCRA. So it's present, it's green. Um, and so we would conclude that we do have one methanogen in these um, genomes. And then what substrates might this organism be able to use based on its genomic potential? So if you kind of scroll, scan over from that um, arrow, you can see that it might have the potential to use acetate, methanol, and maybe um, CO2, it's two CO2. And so um, you can kind of see that there. Now, um, it might be tempting the way that it's, this is, I wanted to bring this up because it might be tempting to think, you know, I I'm in the methanogenesis and methanotrophy column, and I see that, you know, acetate is lit up all over the place, but you really do need to have the functional gene, MCRA, and then you can look into the substrates to really diagnose a methanogen. Okay. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah. So that's like reverse being aware that like reactions can be reversible and mm -hmm. have multiple contexts, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so like an example is that trimethylamine to dimethylamine could be used elsewhere, not for methanogenesis, usually in the production of CO2. And so um, we just have to be thinking about those kinds of things. And so um, here we should look for the MCRA. Yeah. And those pitfalls can be common across a variety of metabolisms. So it's always important to do what Kayla said and look for multiple pieces of evidence that something's yep, there. Exactly. Okay, what is a kazyme and what database is used to profile kazyme? So a kazyme is a carbohydrate active enzyme um, and these are made up of glycoside hydrolases, glycosyltransferases, polysaccharide lyases and, and enzymes with auxiliary activities related to carbohydrates. Um, and so what's really special about DRAM is that um, it parses the annotations from Kazymes to the substrate level. So beyond just saying my genome has 10 GH5s, um, we can say that it uses these particular carbohydrates or has the potential to. Um, and so what database is used to profile those kazymes is dbcan. Okay. Okay, so question 14, what kazymes are well represented in your genomes? So again, this is an instance of, I can look at my product HTML, um, file and this is the gut. So it's lit up all over the place for these um, kazymes. Um, so what I did is then go to the products TSV. And so what you can see in there is your bins um, are along the left column. And then across the top is each um, substrate in this product.html file. And there's a true or false for um, do you have this process or do you have the potential to use these? Um, specific substrates, but based on kazymes. And so there's a true or false in there. And so I counted the number of trues um, to find that chitin and arabinose cleavage um, are the most prevalent, um, but there are many, many, many others. And so this is an instance where you might want to, in this particular study, these sets of genomes, I would be really interested to compare across, you know, what kind of kazymes they have and um, do we see different sub different substrate utilization profiles per genome. Um, and I do think I wanted to mention um, somebody in the chat earlier brought up a pan genome question. So this would be like you could compare across all these genomes just the um, kazyme. So this would be a way to do that um, really with the product. Um, okay. Um, question 15. So the product notes that bin 45 has the potential to utilize starch. How was this called made by DRAM? 
and what GHs does the spin have? And so um, this was the little example I gave in the beginning. So hint, hint. And so you can see that um, if you mouse over bin five, we can see that this call was made based on GH15, GH13, GH133, and GH57. Um, and then we can go also in the distillate and look and see if we wanted to know, okay, what starch GHs does this bin have? We could search, search by starch um, and look that up. Okay, and then question 16. So question 16, I don't have an answer for because I'm assuming we all pick different bins, um, but I really put it here just because um, before you, you know, dive into your genomes and I only, you know, I only want to look at kzymes or I only want to look at whatever you're interested in, I would encourage you to go through each of the files and just see what's represented because there's a lot of information, especially in the distillate, distillate's my favorite, you can see so many things profiled um, for each of your genomes and you can scan across all your genomes at once. And so um, it's really important just to like look and see what's in there because you might find um, interesting things or you might find that something you're doing manually is already being done in DRAM. And so um, I really just put this question here to sort of cue you to like go look through the files and see what what's you can find. Um, and yeah. Yeah, and the interesting thing for bins is going to be different. There might be something that pops up in one bin and mm -hmm. you don't have to be limited to the one metabolism that you care about that's in DRAM. It really makes it so you can look across and take that even that pan genomics type approach to looking at what's going on. Oh. And then, so that's all the questions we are. That's all the questions we had uh, as part of those um, that worksheet. Um, and 